Welcome everybody, Namaste Saigon. We're very fortunate today to have a, a very interesting guest here. I mean, all our guests are interesting, but this one just goes beyond. His name is Patrick Gavot. He's from France. Am I saying that right, Gavot? Gavot, that's correct. Oh, okay. I mean, I used to speak French because I'm Canadian, but I lost it. You know, you don't use it, you lose it. And uh, now I just say I'm petit peu, and that solves the problems. We switch to English and we go on. <laughs> Thank you, Jay. <laughs> Thanks for being here, man. I really appreciate it. Me too. Thank um, you for having me. Yeah, we're gonna. I'm gonna get to know you a little bit so that I mean, we already know each other, but people out here don't. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know you've been in Saigon for how many years? Eleven years? No, uh, fourteen years. Fourteen. Yeah. So, uh, a little. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, there's people who've been here longer, but I mean, it's about the quality of time. I mean, you spent your time here. You developed a business here. You have your family here, you're married to Vietnamese women and you have kids. So you've really gotten deep into living here. Definitely. I mean, I, I consider Vietnam to be the place uh, that I belong to, you know, is that uh, we will always have a home here and we will always come back here. This is where my children are born. This is where my wife is born. Uh, this is where I had some of the best years in my life. And this is the country where I spend the most time all together in my whole life. So, uh, so yes, I do have very, very strong tie with Vietnam and um, I, I, I connect with the people, I connect with the, the values and, 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 and what this country stands for and, and it's, it is the first place on earth that I have lived to after being to 64 countries and living on 8 countries and 5 continents that I can, I can be myself. Because that's the greater thing about you know Vietnam is that uh, there's not that judgmental society which we have in France, where uh, or in the West, or in the West in general, and, and you are allowed to be who you are for as long as you don't bother someone else's uh, toes. So in Vietnam, I, I, I was able to blossom, to grow, and, and you know to become a better uh, version of my own self. So I, uh, I can be thankful to that and thanks to Vietnam for giving me so much and, and the opportunity to, to be as authentic as I wish to be all the time. Yeah. You know, that's an interesting point you brought up that uh, I guess in a way people are less judgmental here, they're more accepting. I mean in the West, in Canada, US, if you're a little bit different from others, you're considered, oh that guy's weird, that guy's strange, but look he wears strange clothes, or he, he does this or whatever, you know, they're always looking for some judgment to make on you, Correct. whereas there are very few places in the world, and Vietnam is one of them, but I mean, even places like uh, Tokyo, for example, there's people who walk around and live their whole life dressed up as a robot, nobody bothers them, you know what I mean? So you can go to real extremes in a place like that, but what I've noticed about Vietnam is that it's just perfect. There's so many people that have different styles and things like that, they're just all accepted, you know? You can be um, very casual here, you can wear jean shorts and t-shirt and walk around, and you can wear a suit to walk around. Every Nobody really looks at you and you know, judges you. I'm not sure what is the reason behind that. Maybe they're just um, less judgmental due to um, Buddhist thinking, because I mean, Buddhism, they talk about trying not to judge things too much. Or maybe it's just that uh, foreigners and um, their differences haven't been here that long. I mean, it's only been about 20, 25 years now that the country has really opened up to people in the West. So why do you think that might be, that they're so accepting? I mean, some of the points that you mentioned certainly do play a role. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we can narrow it down into two key terms that exemplify what Vietnam stands for, in my perspective at least. Uh, that is tolerance and that is resilience, which are two very strong um, values that Vietnam stands for. So why are they like this? I think that if you look in the past, if you look at the history, it's been a country that has been through so much challenges and so much difficulty and so much pain, you know, uh, that they had no choice but to learn to be resilient 
in face of adversity, when you face adversity on a regular basis coming at you all the time, the only thing that can keep you alive is to keep a level of hope and to wait for better days to come. So they've been accustomed to living in a society where things can be tough for a very long time, but they are patient, they are resilient, and they will wait for better days to come because you know it's not always dark. The light shines after the dark. So that's what Vietnam has for themselves, you know. Uh, and, and if you put that in a simple picture, uh, it took them patiently 150 years to kick the French out, <laughs> but in the end they got it. Uh, I believe, historically speaking, it took them a thousand years to kick the Chinese out. <laughs> that's quite an patience, accomplishment. Right? The patience. <laughs> you know, that's a lot of patience. Which... They get the job done, but it, they're very patient. Exactly. And, and that relates also to maybe a, a relation with time. Uh, they, they don't perceive time as we do in the West, you know, and, and they are not, you know, it's why people are not always on time at meetings and, and you know, they are less... Uh, 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 require uh, they are less uh, demanding on you know respecting this. They are flexible time. You know what is time? Oh, I will come to visit you this morning, and then they come two days later. The electrician to fix your thing. For two days you had no electricity. That's the way it is. But you know that that's relating how they see things. They look at a much longer uh, span of time instead of us who are focused on on way too short of a time frame, and and they wait patiently. So now relating to the second point, which is about tolerance. Uh, the fact that they were closed uh, for the last 20, 25 years made it that when it opened, people were you know, eager to see what was behind uh, the limitation that was there before. And, and, therefore, and, and it made it that the Vietnamese people, that's their very, very big difference, is they are genuinely uh, driven to learn. It's a, this is Confucius based, you know, about always learning. Education is extremely important in the Vietnamese society. But, but for them, uh, you know, the opening of the world was an opportunity to see behind what they knew and an opportunity to learn. So when a foreigner comes to Vietnam, for most Vietnamese, they don't see it as a different, as an invader. They see it as an opportunity to discover something they may not know, as an opportunity to learn new ways of doing things. And there's still in the mindset a lot of uh, hopes that the, the foreigner can bring a lot of value to Vietnam, who sometimes is not as professional, so they see opportunities in learning to be with a foreigner and then learn from him on how to be more professional, how to improve themselves, how to grow. So these are very strong, you know, valuable, very yes. interesting one. Yeah, so they look at differences as uh, with a sense of curiosity and you know, interest. Opportunities. Opportunity. You yes. know, instead of risk. Yeah. So there is a, a we in the ways we are in a fear mode. We see it as a fear, like they're different. Yeah. Different is not good. We should be careful, you know, exactly. stay away from the strange people. It, it is normal because it, we are a very ancient and old society. So we are very conservative in our way of thinking. And we have so much that in fact we kind of fear to lose what we have. Because when you have so much, the only thing you do is try to protect it. what you got. And and here, I mean, they had nothing during the wars. They lost everything. So they are not trying to protect much that they don't have, you yes. know? But they are trying to acquire more. And, and how they do it is by being open and, and, and uh, inclined to meet differences and to learn from others. So that makes it that there is no racism. And we talk about tolerance, this is reflected as well in the religion. Because here there's no I thought, no conflict of religion. I mean, you have Muslim, you have Buddhist, you've got Christians and, 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 and others and Hindus and so on. And each of them live peacefully. And what's very funny is that you will often find a, a Buddhist who is praying uh, uh, maybe in an Hindu temple or uh, even in a Christian uh, church. And I mean... They no. don't see that there is a problem with that. No, that's yeah. right. And they respect that others may have different perspective. And, and, you know, and for as long as everyone is happy, then why not be? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I mean, as to your point, just down the street is a Hindu temple. Yeah. Just a little bit down the street from that, there's a mosque. Yeah. And uh, then just a bit further down was a, a church yeah. of some kind. Yeah, I mean. And there's all kinds everywhere. Correct. But uh, I remember a friend of mine, he said that his mother 
50 or 55 years ago, she prayed for him at this uh, Indian temple. She prayed to have a son. Okay. And he was born. Just after that, she got pregnant with him. So he said that he's very attached to that temple, right. although he doesn't visit it. But when he sees it, he remembers that story. So, and they're not Hindus. They're not even Buddhists. They're, uh, I think they were born, he was born a Christian. Mm -hmm. But they don't really take it that seriously, that we have to stick to this and not do this, you know. Mm -hmm. So it's very interesting. But taking into account the way that things are a little bit different here and more open, how do you think um, they have, how do you think it's made any difference in how they've dealt with uh, what's been going on lately in the world? I mean, in one way, We've been very lucky here in Vietnam because COVID hasn't really had much of a stronghold here. And it's one of the safest places to be. In fact, they've had, I think, maximum 35 deaths. Correct. It's amazing for a country this big. Sure. It's 100, almost 100 million people. Correct. So it's, uh, it's amazing. And I know that um, people aren't really that scared about it here. Most of the people are pretty confident that... Uh, the country has got a good, good, uh, you know, protection going on. You know, no one's been allowed to come in for a long time, except for very few people or or leave. So I think that um, they've been very careful and done a good job with it. But it has affected a lot of people in a lot of other ways. I mean, for yourself, you had a company that you developed over the last few years, and I think that now you're thinking about changing things up because. The company is no longer uh, the same as it used to be, right? Sure. And if you don't mind, maybe let us address this point later and, and just address the point you just mentioned because that's very interesting. Sure. Why did Vietnam succeed so well? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that many of the people in the West do not realize what are the key elements. And in fact, the success story of Vietnam is, has been replicated in a variety of countries around the world. And most of them are developing countries. So when you look at what happened with the COVID, you know now that the COVID has affected mostly Western civilized developed countries. Countries where there is a lot of money <laughs> and country where big pharma has a big hold on the system. And you know, other countries which don't have the funds, like Madagascar or so on, uh, decided to go other ways and, 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 and treat this, this, the, the problem with natural solutions or simpler solutions. And in Vietnam, they, they, you know, they knew that, uh, medically speaking, they couldn't cope with too much disease. They also have a past experience dealing with uh, such viruses. I mean, there have been a, a variety of viruses in the last 20 years, which you know we all know about, that have hit Vietnam. So they have already practiced how to handle such situations, which makes them better prepared. Okay, so we're back from our bathroom break. <laughs> Fresh and ready to go. So we were talking about uh, work-life balance and what I've learned in this last uh, uh, very interesting and unusual year about uh, what's important in life. Um, I, I, I've learned that my work-life, my idea of work-life balance was completely off. And of course, I have a Western mentality, so I thought it's all about money and career and I have to, you know, you need money, you need uh, security, you need uh, materialistic, material things, you know, all of these things. So these are the things we were taught that we need to have these things to have a good life. And I was pursuing those things and I was very happy. But I realized from staying home in the last year that I think I would have been much more happy and I will be more happy if I spent more time with the people that I love. Uh, because I was spending very little time with them and as a result, I think that I was becoming a little bit Well, I know that in the last year I've become more attached and more Connected with my wife We've always had a decent relationship, but you, know, you become a little bit You grow a little bit apart not an unhealthy amount that you want to break up, but at least you spend most of your time apart with other people and that becomes a bigger part of your life than your time with your family and your wife and connecting. I mean, there's only so much connecting you can do when you get home at 8 o'clock and you watch TV for an hour or two and then you go to bed. You know, so 
But now that I've been home mostly, I've seen my daughter grow up. She's uh, one year and eight months now. And I would have missed out on 80% of it. I'm just waiting for this noisy Can you imagine? <laughs> Surprise! <laughs> That's the way it is when you film from uh, a cafe and uh, you have a surprising uh, grinder who's suddenly turning and spinning the beans. It's just part of the show. <laughs> it's part of the show. They're making our coffee. It's going to be brewed on the spot and I'll let you know how it felt. <laughs> okay. So how about you? How has this last year been for you? What have you, what are your takeaways? How do you feel about it? I think, I mean, it's been for myself. Uh, there are a variety of levels you can look at it. So, you know, uh, it's been challenging. That I think that's, can be said to me, but can be said to most people. Uh, and, and to me, that has been most challenges uh, business-wise uh, because I had, you know, built my business for the last 12 years and I was actually planning to sell it and planning to retire and uh, go travel the world with my family. That was my plan. Uh, but uh, because of COVID, uh, things changed. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we, we lost uh, over 80% of our business. Uh, so obviously we had to downsize greatly. Uh, we've been able to survive so far. So but now you only have five cars and three boats. Uh, and a yacht. No, no. <laughs> it's a joke. <laughs> no, no, no. Now I've got only when you are laughing, you're just in it and you are here and now, you know. And then when you are dancing, it is the exact same. You are in connection with your the music, with the environment, with the beat, with the person you may be dancing with, with the flow, with the public, and there is a total wholeness and connection with everything. 